we are going to pick up where we left off. Oh, good. Hi. This is part two, and I I got a little bit, um, I got kind of humbled when I realized how could I have the audacity to think that I could possibly, can you see okay? There's Martha Washington, by the way. George is taking a break. I guess he's attending to businesses of state today. <clears throat> anyway, I thought you might like to see his wife. Um, yes, today I would like to talk about a little bit more about leading. And it's just a word. It's just a word, leading. But you can go all over the world and see that people lead horses without lead ropes. No, just lock on. Let me see if you can see here. Okay. I'm sorry that the way this laptop is and to use my notes, you're not going to see me. You see part of me. That's enough. Uh, to really do this properly, I want to be able to really have access to what I've written here and the questions that all of you have put up. They're really important to me. But I think before we begin with all of the, um, well, I won't say the, 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 the drama or the crises, but let's face it, there's something about trailer loading that becomes emotional for many people, and this is understandable. But really, the problem with it is that when you're loading a horse that isn't interested in listening to you, it's really just holding up the mirror in a very unpleasant way about all the little pieces that go into trailer loading that are missing because if they were in place it would work okay this is really the point and what I would like to say is that you know if you can lead a horse from both sides to be sure it doesn't mean drag him from both sides and to be sure it doesn't mean that your arm is the lead rope it doesn't mean that when you're leading you're confronting it doesn't mean that when you're leading, you're wondering if he's still there and have to turn around and look because for some reason you need to do it. I don't know why you need to do it, but if you need to do it, you're really not leading. We have to be clear about this. Okay. Hi, everybody. I see you from all over the place. Isn't that nice? I hope we all are going to learn something together about this and be able to help other people when they get in trouble, you know? That's what Bill meant when he said, good horsemanship is handed down from one friend to another. I buy a lottery ticket every week, I'll have you know. Just missed that $480 million that passed by on Sunday. Darn it all. I don't see the need to uh, charge for this information. I have a lot of people ask me if I've lost my mind or if I've just inherited some money. No, I neither one. I think my mind is doing fine, and no, I haven't inherited any money. I just know that uh, from one of the reasons I didn't start on time yesterday, well, partly because all these questions came blowing in and spur of the moment, but, you know, I got very worked up and very emotional about it because what I realize is that many of you don't have help and you don't really know how to load a horse and you're willing to say so and willing to ask for help. That's very touching to me. It's very moving. And so what am I going to do? Sit over here with all this in my head and say, oh, well, tough luck for you. I had to learn it the hard way you do too. No, that's not nice. You're still going to learn it the hard way, even if I tell you any, everything I've ever figured out, because it's, it is how many horses in the world and how many people. None of these events will ever be duplicated exactly the same way. But after this many years of um, loading horses, and I must say I probably have loaded it doesn't matter how many, just I can't count them, that's for sure. Thousands, really, I'm sure of it. But anyhow, that still doesn't give me your experience or your horse. It doesn't give me your point of view, your trailer, or your perspective. So what I'm going to endeavor to do is to discuss the importance of leading a horse from both sides. And by that, I don't mean pulling him up over the top of you. I don't mean having a whip between you and his front legs so that you can smash him from not coming up on you after he's been taught and rewarded for crowding. I don't mean, as I said before, jeopardizing your, um, what do you call this one? Come on, there's a word. I know shoulder, but there's a, 
there's a joint anyway that it's it's the ace it's the it's when you really tear your shoulder off it's like you pull it's like pulling out a drumstick on a chicken when something you hang on to just sucks your shoulder right out of your body i've seen that happen to people and boy that's a bad one anyway if you're not using a lead rope and thinking that holding a thousand pounds by the head is a plan well better have a perfect day that's all i can tell you so then we're going to talk about today leading from both sides and i do mean leading letting the horse follow understanding that every time you turn around to check on him it does cause him either to keep coming and bump into you and get in trouble or it requires that he um, stop and slow down and then be pulled forward for being polite enough not to run you over. These are things we must really look at in our choices of how and when to move our own feet. I really feel strongly about this that you you don't uh, don't be too quick to blame a horse without considering your behavior from his point of view because if it's just you and the horse, the thing that he has to take into consideration before he has a response of any kind is, what does he think you mean? Second, after he has an idea, does he care? You can set it up so he doesn't care very, very easily. And we don't want that. We want a real partner that is really trying to understand and reaching for the meaning in your actions, you know. This is very important, and that's no different than when you have a family or you're getting to know somebody in business or anywhere else, or if you're just taking a, a plane ride or going to the grocery store. It's important to think before you speak. Think before you act. Think before you make a response where you have lots of doubt. Take a few moments extra. What the hell is that? Something coming around in here. Um, anyway, so there are there are ways to lead a horse up a ramp. There are ways to lead a horse, for better or for worse, into a step-up trailer. Um, oh, this thing. Sometimes I don't... Sometimes this doesn't work out too well. Hang on. Uh, so, we have... Um, the width of your trailer, the standard width in the States is seven feet wide or eight feet wide, depending on if you have your wheel wells of your trailer inside or outside of the exterior walls. But either way, it's usually wide enough for two horses. It can be very helpful to move a center divider to one side or the other. And if you've got a young horse that you're training, try to start to think about his future uh, and make sure that you teach him to lead on both sides and load in both sides of his of the trailer if you have a two horse straight ahead now it when it comes to getting a horse up in there um, and whether you're leading up a, on a step up or you're asking him to follow you up a ramp, it can often be extremely important to be flexible and understand that in the middle of leading you may need to send him you may need to adjust and step out of his way or um, accommodate some uh, other variable. Could be the weather, could be bad footing, could be snowing, raining. You could have had to park on a hill. The ramp could be imbalanced. There are many, many things. You might have just popped, you might have just been loading, uh, had a trip and gotten out someplace and have a flat tire and have to unload. That's certainly happened to me. It's not very much fun either. But Many of these larger trailers, slant load trailers and uh, gooseneck trailers actually do not have the ability to lower a ramp down. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, if your horse can um, get up in a ramp trailer and you don't need help uh, picking that tailgate up, that's lovely, but if it makes a huge horrible sound, Maybe you get, need to get him used to these sounds of rusted metal and banging on the door and slamming around with a hammer when you're trying to get these neglected, year-round, unprotected trailers uh, functional on the spur of the moment, either for an emergency trip to the vet or, you know, you lend your trailer out or you're going to start helping somebody get their horse moved. A little planning goes a long way, and so does some WD-40. Uh, they also have stuff called balustrol, and, and I think they have some spray oil in Europe called 
I'm going to say 57, but I don't know. I can't remember that one. And in the end, just use some olive oil, for heaven's sakes. Just come on. Just get some grease in there and go for it. You use mayonnaise if you get totally hard up. I've, I've been hard up on that. You can use whatever works. You just need to make sure that, that, um, that those springs and the hinges are not so rusty that you're going to end up with no tailgate when you get there. And it would be probably very helpful if the amount of noise it makes behind a green horse, a young horse, untrained horse, isn't so horrifying that he, you know, has to suddenly question his decision to hop in there for you. There's nothing nice, absolutely nothing nice, about finding out that you've got a horse that's not prepared to stay in there after you've closed the door. Um, I'm not going to go through, you know, a long list of horrible things that can happen because I would like a different focus here. But just let's say that in the overview, whether you send him in past you on the left or the right or you lead him in, straight behind you or from the left or right, depending on if you have enough room. All of these are things that you'd like to start to look at ahead of time, before the day, before the moment that you need to go someplace. And if you haven't got a trailer of your own or the opportunity to practice, let's get these basics really clear. And these basics in Bill's book, for example, and in many other places, if you've had notes that you took at clinics or you have other horse books, go ahead use those but in if you've got Bill's book as a reference chapter 4 has uh, eight different sections that are very uh, specific in their outlining of the basic things that are needed to get a horse comfortable for just about any job you have and in order it has to do with really getting the root of the neck available there are seven vertebrae in the neck and the deepest ones are down in the chest between the shoulders, okay? It's uh, C, it's called C for cervical, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Well, the one is at the top, right behind the ears. Two and three and four are pretty available in the neck. You sort of curry the neck and give injections and put your gear all over those vertebrae. But by the time you're down by six and seven, they're kind of well protected by the shoulders. And some horses even have number five stuff down in there. I don't know why. But, um, it depends on how a neck hangs on a horse, how it's set into those shoulders. And if you ever have a chance, I'm not trying to suggest something. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that you, uh, well, I don't want to gross anybody out, but if you've got any access to um, a bone pile at a ranch, uh, you can get a long way just by looking at how a goat or a cow is set up. You just pull those bones apart and have a look and better off if you have a horse there that's how I started thinking about these things in more depth and in more detail um, because really when you realize that the opening the opening of the uh, well where all of your 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 food and your um, well a horse's breathing apparatus and his ability is access to nutrition takes place right at the front of the right in the sternum, the front of the rib cage, both of his airways and his esophagus, his digestive process, and all that food channel there goes all the way down in there, and his neck attaches, his neck bone attaches right there. So from there you go one set of pipes into the lungs, one set of pipes into the stomach, and they're not really that different than we are. In many ways they're not, actually. But... Look, I'm no vet, and I'm not getting too much into all this. All I can say is the day you don't control that neck is the day you don't control that hips unless he gives you some sort of honorary access or unless you're willing to just muscle through and, you know, just have the experience of it's awful. That's like trying to get a railroad tie to do something. Just don't have yourself set up to think that muscling yourself through life with a horse that's too stiff to move his neck is any kind of plan because you may wish you hadn't by the time you're riding fast in the wrong direction. That's just it. So let's talk now about something else. I don't know how I get on these subjects where it goes wrong. I think I've seen some of these things and also done them. That's a point, see. Now, 
once you've got your horse in there, the big question that many trainers and many clinicians, lots of sort of popular shows on TV have always talked about, get him in, get him out. Well, that's okay. He's going to have to come out, and it's really good if you don't have the opportunity to let him be around these trailers when they're, he's young or see other horses go in successfully or follow his mother in when he's little. If you don't have these types of opportunities, it sure is a good idea to set up a vehicle. Maybe you can have two sections of a fence and the back of the trailer open with a gate tied open in the middle if you have a stock trailer, slant load trailer. You can even do it with a two horse trailer. But I would, I would take the center bar out, not leave anything up there for him to get stuck on or hang up his legs and neck in the front. Just the idea that he could be comfortable in confinement and you're not just going to be hoping on a one shot good luck prospect, slap the door, hurry up, motor's running, throw some carrots in there, go. No, I've seen that. I'll never forget seeing one lady. I've never saw anything like it in my life. She had a two horse trailer. She came in last resort equestrian center in Fort Collins with that trailer on two wheels and an Arab stud in the back. Now, I kid you not, it looked to me like that thing was going to flip right off the back of her Jeep. And I wasn't maybe as nice as I should have been. But I was upset to see that. And that horse was plenty upset. And um can't remember her name, but I sure can see her. wouldn't tell you the name anyway. That'd be rude, but... It, that horse was so, so, so strung out. And every day it happened like that. Every day I'd try to, try to gently tell her. A couple days, third day, she kept coming in like that. I about lost it. But anyway, amazingly enough, that horse kept getting in for her, kept getting in for her. But the coming out got worse and worse because he became more desperate. So we don't want bad driving. We'll talk about driving on Thursday. I'm going to do these sessions until I have to go to Montana on Thursday. So it's just important to have some empathy and some politeness and also to protect your investment. I mean, you flip your trailer over or get your horse stepped on upside down underneath the other horse, that's going to start costing money. And also it's avoidable, so that's really the point. If we're going to think about how to get the horse out, I would uh, make sure that you understand the limits of the trailer you're presenting to him. Sad is the day when the horse that has never learned to back up finds himself in a two-horse straight ahead after being for years encouraged to turn around or not even back out of a slant load trailer because no one took the time to teach him. You really do, do, do owe yourself and the horse, uh, I say, the investment of time and the patience and, and the skill that it takes to teach him how to go out slowly not blast out, rip the rope out of your hand and end up half a mile away. Nothing like that, please. See it enough anyway, even when you try not to. But this is super important to um, be careful that as they start out or as they get in, that you are not involved in the push-pull, tug-of-war, um, impatient, or personal, you know, crowding and nervous, breath-holding tension that makes them hate the experience and really consider not coming in again. I don't want you to put yourself through that. I don't want you to put your horse through that or anyone else's horse. It is, for some reason, such an emotional thing that people get through, and I think it could be part of it, is that if you're not really comfortable driving in a trailer or bringing your horse around or you've heard and seen the way other people force their horses in or lose their horses in public at the fairgrounds when they blow out with a lead rope or a chain attached to them, I mean, there are just probably more things that go wrong in this, in this little assignment. Let's get the horse down the road in a closed box on wheels. I'm sure they had their wrecks at the freight yards when they were shipping war horses, you know, 40 to a box. And I'm sure they have the problem, you know, when they're taking them to slaughterhouses in those great big semis. But uh, the incidence of real damage and real trauma is no less at the back of a nice fancy trailer with a nice destination and a expensive horse and a and a loving owner. You just, sometimes people just lose it and they forget that. 
allowing the horse to look around, and that's the main thing, instead of trying to get control of the root of his neck and his pole and micromanage every little inch of his hide, how about just letting him use what God gave him, which is his natural curiosity, to check out the scene? You know, hey, what's this? What's that? What I see up there? What about that hay pile up in the front? Do you mind moving over so I, do you mind moving over so I can get up in there and have a look? Now see, you could do that. And um, it doesn't hurt at all to have a little food up there for them. Please try not to hang a loose bag of hay between two horses so it slaps them both in the face and they spend the entire trip pulling back. What I would do is I would either weld some U-bolts or get somebody who you know to help you set up a safe trailer. Now, I don't think I'm not thinking about this. I am. I'm getting to my notes here in a minute, and I have to be quick. Now, I told you I'd leave this to an hour. I'll be, I think we started at about five or six after three. So I've got a little over, ha a little over half an hour now, um, about 40 minutes. And I'm going to just tell you, um, parenthetically here, that I have lots and lots and lots of trailer loading footage, some of it good, some of it not so fun. Um, and I also have some stories I'm going to tell you before this is all said and done about mistakes I've made and people that I've helped that really gotten a fix. But those things are less important than the very basic concept that a horse has curiosity in whatever you can show him. What he can't control is your relationship with a wristwatch, your re relationship with the idea of time. So this is why, if you can borrow a trailer, it's good to let them explore these things on their own, and it's good to let them see that you are not upset. Read a book. Have your lunch on the tailgate. Get the ramp down and let them come up and pass you by and go eat some hay and back out and go on their own if you have the good fortune to set it up that you either have a long enough rope to hold them on or you can just park a trailer in a truck in the paddock or in the yard. You can have two set, two panels that are, as I said before, you've got two panels that go up flush on either side of the back of your trailer. You can do that as well and just let them have at it. Ana Kayla Carmasi out there in Pengrove, California. There's a girl who knows how to load warm bloods and teach them. And to be honest with you, most of the people that I've worked with are pretty darn good at loading. You, how you get good? You see people do it in a way that makes it look like you wish that were your horse. And I've gotten some good, uh, good instruction in my life and some not so useful things I've learned and I found out right away what fits most horses is what fits most horses. It's not, not ever a bad idea to have a couple of backup plans in your toolbox, but to just start thumping and uh, threatening and getting on the phone and calling people to load the back end of the horse while you're holding the front feet in there, there's certainly better ways to do it than that because this series of hour long, you can hold me to that, um, these series of hour long discussions is going to be really geared toward the person who is loading alone. That would be me. 99% of the time. In fact, I'd rather load alone. Thank you. There is a time if you get what, if you have, especially if you're dealing with a horse that has had a lot of bad experiences, it can be very helpful to have somebody put a well-placed pebble on the back end of a horse's butt right at the point where he's ready either to pull you out there like Mary Poppins and send you flying or jump in there and flatten you. There's those two options, you know. Some of these horses once they're just right on that raw edge of livening up, they don't know where to jump back with all of their might or jump into that trailer and fully commit. You better be out of the way, I can tell you that. Uh, there's a, another problem that happens with people who are loading with their cowboy hats. You want to duck down under that chest bar in those two-horse trailers after you've spent all morning getting that horse to follow you and you flip your hat off right in his nose? That'd be avoidable. You know, you just got to think how you, don't worry about how you look without your cowboy hat because the horse would sure rather see your head than that hat come flying off in his face. I've seen a lot of people exit suddenly with that plan. Anyhow, 
it'll set you back a couple hours getting that horse used to getting in the trailer with somebody with a hat on. So these are small things that I'm mentioning so that you get your horse used to a hat flying around or you don't give him a sacrificial hat that he can stand on. If you've got a couple out in the barn, just let him stomp on a... You can let him stomp on an old hat. It doesn't matter. Just let him not be afraid of something that's going to fly off your head if you're either... Um, Let's see, is there a nice way to say clumsy and careless? Probably not. If you're careless enough and clumsy enough or your hat is so loose that it can't be touched without flying off in the face of the horse behind you, well, this is something that needs to be planned for. And I don't mean this in an insulting way. Look, accidents happen. Is The worst thing is losing a horse that's afraid of a dragging lead rope in a public place. That is a dangerous thing. It's a hell of a lot of liability. It's really good to avoid that one. So, when we're talking now about uh, how he's going to exit, how he's going to exit the trailer, whether it is that he turns around or he backs out, we'll talk about backing also in a minute, but backing was also very well covered, I think, in September and October. But I'll, I'll address that here in a few minutes as well. Let's not think about whether he turns around or backs out until we talk about how he stands in there because there's a real disservice that you do when you go in and out and in and out and front feet up and back out and front feet up and back out I've seen quite a bit of that uh, and not just recently but all the whole time um, bring him in bring him out well that becomes the training if you never let him dwell in there he's got his idea that rather than wait for you to ask him out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 times in a session. And don't think people don't do it. They do. They really, really do. The opportunity to support that horse is built in with your ability to breathe, stay cool, Discipline yourself not to correct a horse as he's making a try. Don't start micromanaging these things as they are exploring. If he has to leap in, don't shove him out and tell him he was wrong and get all upset with him and tell him he has to walk in like a gentleman because the fact he came in is the point. So if he hasn't learned how to come in and take a step in before you get upset with him, you better find out if he's got sciatic pain. Better find out if the angles on his back feet are right. I'm serious now. A lot of horses can't even stand up in a trailer because their back feet hurt so much. Not only the back feet, you got the coffin bones going right down through the sole of the foot, but worse than that, you got the pelvis offset and at the wrong angle. They have to suddenly, for the first time, stand squared up when the whole rest of the time their life is lived on with their... Ah, where's my... Guess I, oh, here it is. Here, I can show you right here. Just a minute. I got a nice little, a nice little example right here. Remember him from the other day? There's the right hind. Here's the left hind. Now, this little horse is doing something different right now. He's scratching his hock. But look, you look around your barnyard, you'll see a lot of these horses hang out in their stalls with this right hip. I don't know which the direction is for you, but anyway, this is the right hip on him. And they will stand like this, and then they get in that two-horse trailer, and the next thing you know, their back is killing them. And they've got shooting pains. You've got a lot of these horses with their feet wrong and with handling too much at the head and discipline for crowding and discipline for being uh, up in your face after they've been actually rewarded well for being there. Hand fed, pet, brought up on the cross ties, all of this stuff gets them very confused. So they learn how to drop a hip back to stay stable on two heavy front legs while all sorts of things are done to them. Why do I mention this? It's not a digression. It's not a diversion. Because when you put a butt bar up behind a horse that is just sausaged in there, just like a 10 pound, 10 pounds of sausage in a five pound casing. Try loading these warm bloods in these trailers and these draft horses in these two horse trailers. I've had them so stuffed in there you can't believe it sometimes. And you just, God, you just pray 
You just pray it works out. And even Bill, if you look in his book, he's loading butte tacked up, and I had a, I was horrified to see how tight that saddle was up against the roof of that trailer. But Bill, he taught her how to lower her head and walk up in there. He sent her right by, tapped her on the butt with his cane. She had it worked out with him. That's what she did because when Bill went out riding, he had to saddle her at home and, you know, drop that saddle down off that string and that pulley and do, him, do her up and then put her in there and off to town he'd go or off to some other ranch. So you want to make preparations. The horses are nothing wrong with uh, putting a saddled horse in a trailer. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I would suggest if you're going to have more than one horse in there or you've got a decent saddle on there, you're going to use your you're going to use the strings that are right at your rosette that's behind your well, whichever, it doesn't matter what strings. They're usually not so long right there. I always I always put 3-foot strings on there and then tie them up until I need them. But you can take your stirrups across and then you tie them so that the horse doesn't get hung up on a there's nothing like having a stirrup fender ripped off your saddle on the way to go do a job, is there? So and you just make sure also that you remember if you're trailering a, a horse in a western saddle and his stirrups aren't tied up and things go wrong, you can get a hoof through there. Some other foot, some other horse can get a hoof, front or hind hoof, if they're not used to traveling together. So these are small things that you want to remember. It's probably not going to break a horse's leg. It'll just tear your rig up. So many, many things that can be avoided by getting those horses comfortable standing. So let's say but you've got a horse that can't stand in there. Let's just say that. How are you going to get a horse to stand? Well, maybe some people would say, well, tie him in there with a bag of feed. Maybe not. Bag of feed, tying him up in there, uh, that's tricky because what if he doesn't tie? What if you think he's tied because you've seen it, but he gets the lead rope under that bag and then he reaches around on his chest, okay? And then he's got, just got to take a little bite right here, just a small little bite right there where that fly is. Suddenly he's got that whole half a bale of hay up right in his nose. Better tie that bag tight, okay? What I like to do on a big bag of hay is I tie the bottom right up to the top so I've got a big ball of hay up on the front and the lead rope's nowhere near it. His lead rope is back by his shoulder, and he can reach out for that hay. But if you're not in that fortunate of a position, you secure that hay. Because once they start freaking out in that trailer and they get their lead rope tied up with a hay bag, uh, believe me, the horse next to them will start that nonsense too. And if you get a tied horse down on the bottom of a trailer underneath another horse and then they're both down there, that is an ungodly mess. That's just terrible. And I mention these things not so you focus on them because that focus can produce those types of events. Any negative focus can bring about what it is that you fear or that what that is that you're trying to avoid. So remember that. What you focus on is what generally happens. But the reason I'm mentioning it is because these things do happen. They happen often. And they are 100% avoidable. And this is the thing you want to... Um, you want to make sure that you don't have your hay net so low that you get a horse that's impatient, standing in the heat, pawing, ripping one of those hay nets down. Many, many unexpected things can happen. And one of the worst, I loaded a horse one day into a wasp nest, a trailer full of wasp nest. Stupid. You got a trailer standing there. You better go in there and really look at where you're going to put that horse because when you're in there with a bunch of bees and the horse at the same time and you've worked hard to get them in there, that is so disappointing. I don't know why, but they probably think you did those stings. They blame you for those bees. I know that. And I, I, I'm one person can't afford to get another bee sting and I'm sure there are many of you out there. Um, so you want to you wanna just look at small things. And, and I'm just right now going to mention it, even though I think I was going to do this another time. I'm watching the clock now. I've got, let's see, I have, um, well, I have 20 minutes. Uh, in your trailer check, okay, I'm 
I don't know if you're taking notes or whether you're going to go back through all this. I, I'm sort of sad that I have so much on my mind because it might be hard to find these things later. But if you have a pen and paper, I'll give you a second and just tell you the things that I really think are important to watch for. And this is, I'm just going to go through it no matter what kind of trailer you have. You'll know the trailers I'm talking about. And um, you can tell me when you're ready. I'll just look at a couple. Maybe some of you are ready, or I'll I, I'll put it also in writing on on a on a little piece of paper on Facebook. Okay, I'll make a post about it, just a little list. But you want to make sure that you have your tires are aired up. You want to make sure you don't have dry rot on your tires. You want to make sure that the valve stems are good on your tires. That's just basic. Okay, now that might not be something a lot of people think about. You make sure you have a valve cover on your valve stem, please. It's not very nice to get a lot of mud and dirt in there because that can let the air out if you get enough dried up mud stuck in that thing. You have a flat tire before you get where you're going or when you get there, you have unload and spend a couple days. Your All four tires are flat when you get ready to get home. There's lots of things that can go wrong. You make sure you have new tires on. Don't use some old Maypop threadbare thing. That's not nice at all. Spend the money. Do it right, you know. Do it correctly, please, because it's the price you can pay for lack of maintenance is really rough. Then there's the old floorboard. Are they any good? Nowadays, you can get aluminum trailers and not have to think much about it, but I still look under a trailer anyway. Just my habit. Um, I was driving behind my husband in 1985 four, five, and I watched my mare go through the floor on the George Washington Bridge in a trailer as I was driving behind there, and she had a foal with her, and I watched the boards fall out. I watched her feet go in the road. We were on the GW Bridge between New Jersey and Manhattan, coming up from a huge place that I kept them out and hundreds of acres when I used to work down... Uh, in one of those big cities down there, out in rural Maryland. I had a lovely place for them. We were driving up from there, and I watched my mares go through the floor about 8 o'clock one night, tear her shoes off. It took me 27 miles to get my husband turned up, pulled over on a two-lane highway up on Route 22, maybe it was 40 miles later. Some of you will know where that is. That was terrible to see. There are many, many things like this that happen. I've heard many stories. All you have to do is see whether or not that your boards are any good. Put the money in. Check your trailer. Keep it right. Clean your floors. Um, it's really important to be ready. That's all I can say. Be ready. Have your uh, wasp killer or your um, bee's nest eliminating stuff ready, whether it's a broom or a bottle of that horrible stuff you got to spray in there, whatever it takes, just get ready. I don't like traveling without water for horses and a couple of buckets somewhere. I don't like traveling without a bale of hay, you never know. Um, I don't like traveling without molasses. You can use molasses in water. It's got some sort of salt, sugar, electrolyte type balance in there. I don't know how it works or why, but I know that when you have bad water where you're going, it's good to be able to have your horses drink. These are really, really important things, you guys. A dehydrated horse dehydrated horse, is a lot more serious than one that won't load. So, just remember that. Your accomplishment, getting them in there. Now, having said that, can a horse go three days without water? Do people do it? Do they trailer horses and not water them? They sure do. Many people do. But my thought is, why push it? Why do Why do that when you're going to stop and get something to drink? You're going to get a coffee? You're going to get your kids some soda and chips and pull it in at the drive-in or have a nice meal on the way home? Is it that hard to water your horses? Sometimes. Sometimes it, it really is. I can say it. And is it worth it? Yeah, it is. So you make sure you make those decisions ahead of time. And um, if it's a pain in the neck, and this is a pain in the neck, and the, getting the shoes done on time is a pain in the neck, and this is a pain in the neck, and that's a pain in the neck, maybe owning a horse isn't the right thing. Maybe leasing one. 
Letting somebody else do all that work would be the better move. I'm just bringing it up because our our notion of what's inconvenient in horse owning is, is sometimes you have to be honest about it. It's directly related to how disposable these animals are at times. And really, it's another topic, and I'll get to it. It is another topic, but horses are disposable. They're you can get them for next to nothing. That's why I mentioned the other day, you know, are you going to need to buy a brand new trailer for a $50 horse or a free one? No, but there's never been more horses uh, that were misunderstood by people uh, than there are now. And there's also been never been a time when there were more used trailers available. The horse industry is, uh, I wouldn't say it's on the way out, but there's certainly a lot fewer people in it um, now than there used to be at this level so go ahead and get yourself a trailer learn how to maintain it have somebody check your springs see whether you've got a torsion axle see whether you can save up and get a torsion axle and do yourself a favor and get some other type of maybe a maybe it's too low maybe you need a higher one for the way you are maybe it would be nice to have a real get big step up so that you didn't have to bottom out in the washes and scare the hell out of your horses um, I knew somebody who drove over a bridge and got the whole trailer stuck right in between the uh, right in between the back wheels. Got the whole thing settled right down there. The it was just like a snug fit, you know. Both rear axles in a 28, 30 foot long gooseneck slapped right down on that cement bridge, and there it was, just stuck on there. One rear tire hanging in the hanging in the air. Two warm bloods in the back. Terrible happens so make a make a taller trailer if you're going to need to put a, a a city trailer in an off-road environment it's hard to have to learn some of these things but you know you gotta gotta plan ahead people are used to planning for things like college for their kids and um the right kind of clothing for a special event that's in the distant future uh the horse could need anything at any moment and the more you think ahead and the better you prepare this horse to lead and to tie and to stand still, the better it is. So let's talk about standing still with a horse that's hooked on to another horse who doesn't want to leave. Maybe you can just bring a friend with him instead of go the hard line and say he's got to tough it out. Bring a, find a horse that he not likes on a first ride if he's had bad trailering experiences. Let him stand next to that horse. Feed them for a couple days in there. That's something you can do. There's no harm in reaching creatively toward the unexpressed needs those horses have. They express it right when it's so critical that you don't have the time or the moment or the resources to address it sometimes. Get to know your animal. Just moving them across town, that word just is tricky. Just moving them across town could lead to many things that you wish you had thought about so let's make sure that on the backing you make sure that even if you have a big box trailer or a stock trailer don't ever think that he won't end up in a two-horse trailer so the first thing you're going to do is make sure he can back up on the ground when you ask without it being a, a big uh, conflict um, I think to be able to just put your hand on that halter knot and lift his chin up a little bit, take some weight off the forehand, and liven up his legs a little bit. You don't need a whip to do this. You can tap him with your boot on his pastern and say, hey, I need this one. You take the diagonal that's farthest ahead and ask him to shift it back as you lift a little weight off his shoulders. I don't think standing back and clocking him in the face with a snap is going to be the answer to unloading your horse from the trailer, so let's not do it. Let's not do it. Back him out politely the way you'd like someone to move you over in a dark theater because that you're standing on their coat. You don't need a punch in the nose because somebody has to go and get popcorn. Okay. So let's talk now about not choices. Before you tie your horse up, let's make sure let's make sure that you can uh, tie a knot. So that when you're ready to tie him, you're not going back to the knot book to wonder what a bowling is. I've had a lot of people tell me about the wonders of these quick release knots, my lord. By the time you set a thousand pounds back, 
in earnest, a thousand pounds that really means it, on a knot, it doesn't matter what you call that knot, you're going to need a knife. So carry one, please, sharp one. The, uh, the, 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 the horse people that I hang out with and the horse people that I train are well equipped. And I'm not talking about some knife you're going to butter your bread with now. This needs to be something where you can go through a halter. You can go through a lot. Hard plastic, a halter, a nylon halter, a, a sopping wet, nasty old cable stiff cotton rope. You need to be able to have a knife that can do the job if you've got a horse upside down or you've got a horse that's in real trouble or you've got a leg over and you can't get out. Let's say you've got a horse with a leg over a lead rope and you can't unload. You better have a knife that works and a spare lead rope. This is what I mean by the planning. Carry some extra feed, carry some extra lead ropes, maybe an extra halter. And, um, you know, in some states you can you can take tranquilizers, you can take uh, banamine, so that you just, you know, get, get your kit together so you're ready, okay? Get your kit together. You want to have things available. You're not going to plan to use them, but if you need them, they're there. And by the time you hit the road, you should be able to just sit back and drive and not worry. If you are worried, you're the worrying type, then for God's sake, put a camera in the back and pay whatever it takes to get a screen in front so that you can see what's going on. And uh, that can be very helpful. I've been involved in those situations too, uh, where you know I, we had the good fortune to pull over and not get a horse too badly hurt down under another one in the back. That was not that long ago. I helped somebody through that mess where we could not unload. And uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to approach the sensitive topic of personal fitness. I'm not as fit as I used to be by any stretch of the imagination, but if you have to get up into your gooseneck trailer or your slant load trailer through a window to help a horse and you haven't got the physical capacity to do it, you make sure that if you don't have the uh, jungle gym monkey arms to grab yourself and get up in there, you should be traveling with someone who can or you should have another plan, or you get one of those little drop-down foot peg steps that you can get from the Sundowner Company, and you just have them lagged into the side of your trailer so you can climb up there with some hand grips and help your horse out. There's something also that has some, um, uh, that, that you want to handle before you get in there. Oh my goodness, 12 minutes. Um, and that is, what do you do when your horse can't step on his own lead rope uh, without rearing up, running backwards and having a heart attack, uh, that needs to be handled first. You don't know whether that horse might load fast behind you and slap your head right into that chest bar and you're on the floor for a second and he's on his lead rope and then all that trailer loading practice goes out the window because he just stepped on his rope, reared up, smashed his head in the roof, and now you both got a headache. It happens. I've seen it happen. I couldn't invent this stuff, you know. I couldn't think of it. Oh, there's so many things. You just can't imagine. So you want to get the basics into just the horse handling. Now, there are a lot of people that don't think that you should let a horse drag a halter rope. Well, I would have to disagree. I think there are a whole lot of people that would never have gotten along with a Mustang worth a damn if that horse hadn't had a month dragging a rope at the BLM. And I'm not saying that that's the epitome of the best possible, cleanest horsemanship and all that. But look, what works, works. And that's a function of trial and error, thousands of horses trying to make their way off the, uh, you know, away from being routed out of the kill pens and into the right hands of people. What does it hurt to teach a horse to drag a lead rope? It's going to save you a lot when he's six years old or ten years old and you lose a lunge line in a public place and he goes smoking through the center of the fairgrounds dragging your 30-foot lunge tape because you never taught him how to bring his head up off the lead rope or take his shoulders up before flipping out so he could you just wait in the spring till they go on grass and just experiment with that. You turn one or two of them out to pasture with a four-foot rope on them. Not a big one, just so they understand that they can think their way through releasing the pressure off their head by 
either lifting a shoulder or backing up. Sometimes they get a back foot on it. But it'll go a long way toward getting the horse to think instead of panic. It gets him out of a flight response and into the capacity to use his reason. The horses are intelligent for a reason. It's because they are, have the ability to use their mind, think their way out of pressure, you know. So let's make sure that whether it's standing on a lead rope or you've got a horse that can't put his head down and bring his neck up under a lead rope, okay, so now he's got extra pressure over the back of his head. These are things that need to be thought about before you tie a horse up inside a trailer. So uh, a lot of whether they're going to stay in there or not and learn how to stand, this is after you've done your work on sending and leading and you've got a lot of these basics in there, okay? Now you're in there with him. It shouldn't be, if you've got a horse that can't be without his friend in the barn, he's not going to do much better just because you shut him in a box. He'll do worse. So these are the types of things that be good to have cleared up for him or bring a friend, as I said before. But the turning around, I have a friend who never taught a horse to back out, and she ended up having her chest cavity reduced to the size of a, of a Bible. She needed one after that. It's not funny. That horse smashed her about so flat, almost killed her, broke every rib she had, smashed her lungs just down there like a pancake. Okay, you don't put yourself all right in a trailer with a horse that has to spin around without paying attention to what you've just decided to do. If you know that horse can panic and you know that horse can't back out, you make damn sure you don't put yourself in there where that horse is going to have to show you how strong you're not. There is no amount of strength that a human being can exert on a scared or panicked horse that's going to make a difference. The difference is going to come out in the realization that you're not as strong as you may have thought in that moment. A call came in and interrupted that. So what I'd like you to think about doing is not being in a hurry to load. Not being in a hurry to load at all. And start to really look, if you're in the market to buy a trailer, go get some advice. You make sure that you've got the axles are right, the wheel bearings are, are uh, repacked and fresh. You know what the words are so that when you're on the road, you know how to talk to people. If you get in trouble, you know how to talk to AAA. There's a, there are many other. Oh, I have to. I'll put this up on the Facebook also. There's another uh, in the states anyway. You can get 24-hour roadside assistance if you're traveling with horses. You can get replacement trailers. You can get people who are part of a whole network who come and grab you right off the road with a good truck. If your truck's down, or they'll come and bring a trailer if you need it. For God's sake, don't go across the country by yourself without looking into these things, please. I just I just hate to think about people making these decisions and, you know, just striking out on their own in some sort of bravado or oh, I can do it. Yeah, you can do it, and things can go wrong and will go wrong if you keep doing it enough without paying attention to the small things that really are common sense. Stuff breaks. Stuff with moving parts breaks. Stuff that's out in the weather gets old, gets rusted. Boards that are bearing a lot of weight and continually exposed to the elements underneath and to urine and manure on top, come on. These are important things to think about. Now, on the important matter of unloading, which I'm... Okay, i got six minutes. I'm going to really stick to this. I don't like schedules um, at all. But I'm going to do it. Anyway, on the important matter of unloading, you make sure... You make really sure that if you have been using these I-4 Williams trailers where you can walk that horse in because you have decided not to back him out, you make sure that you know that any horse that has had those trailers and lived with that convenience is likely to take the opportunity to squeeze himself out the human door if he has the chance. And I'm not going to get into the stories about all that stuff. You can imagine. 
You put something that doesn't fit where it doesn't belong, it's not a nice experience. And these horses trying to get out the human door over the chest bar or out the front two, do two windows, the high windows above the little feeders, little feed station and some of these older two-horse trailers, that Hartman trailers and stuff that was popular back in the 50s and 60s. These are dangerous, dangerous events. And the plywood trailers, the single axle trailers with the three quarters inch plywood walls and the fiberglass tops. And I know that they're popular. I know they've been pulled all over Europe for years with four cylinder sedans and no electric brakes. I think that the standards have gotten better and I think that the cost has gone higher. And I think that the realization that this is the realization that this is absolutely not a corner to be cut has has finally gotten through in some of these places where these trailers are used in Europe quite often, and they're over here too. But as light as they are and as convenient they are, they don't hold up well in an accident. They'll flip off the back of a, what do you call it, a tow, a tow ball, a ball, the ball on the tow bar. So you want to make sure you've got breakaway chains, electric brakes that work. You want to have your brake box in the front, you check that and make sure that you know how it works. It isn't just a matter of stomping on the brakes and putting those horses on the floor. You know, you can be a very good driver and just not even know how a brake box works and uh, pile your horses right down to the end of their lead ropes and up through the roof. Don't think I'm kidding about that because th these are things that need preparation, okay? And that's one of the things I did in my apprenticeship program was teach people how to ride a, drive a rig. And I took some students from Europe, friends of mine, over and taught them how to drive my rig on I-90, I-80, I-70. We went all over the place. There's no replacement for experience. And if you, friends of mine in Europe, you want to come over here and learn how to drive a rig on the open road, you tell me. I'll show you. You can come out here and practice all you want. That's a, that's a sincere offer because learning the difference in in backing a gooseneck versus a bumper pull, handling a 20,000 pound load versus a 3,000 pound load at speed in tight traffic conditions. These are things that are really, really important to think about. Um, getting your horse broke to traffic, getting your horse broke to all sorts of situations where you might find yourself on the side of the road. Horses that can't tie are tricky to take on a trip, aren't they? So um, I would like you to think about these things and send me your questions, please. I got, look, I'm happy to get your questions, but I got a pile more of them on my email today at five of three. Those questions aren't going to get answered properly. So you take your time tonight, write out some questions and thoughts. I'm more than happy, more than happy to bring it up uh, tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday, okay? I'm going to hang up now so that you can get on with your evenings or get on with your day. It's a pleasure, and I hope I've brought some useful points up to you. And if I've missed the things that you'd like to know about, I know that there are questions I haven't answered. I've still got several of them right here. Some of them I did answer today. Uh, don't worry about overloading me. I can handle it. 